legal cannabis, the uninvited dilemma with unintended consequences. After years of debate, industry lobbying, watching other states legalize and tax recreational adult marijuana use and commercialization, on June 22, 2021, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont signed into law a commercial cannabis bill. So now, Connecticut communities like Ridgefield must decide how best to adapt. At its first meeting in August, the Social Equity Council identified over 200 of 833 Connecticut census tracts falling into 35 towns that have been disproportionately impacted by marijuana arrests as a result of the war on drugs and whose residents have been prioritized to receive half of the commercial cannabis licenses issued by the state. Ridgefield is one of the 17 other Connecticut towns with a population exceeding 25,000, the threshold to qualify for a license. CT Insider reports that so far 40% of Connecticut towns have banned cannabis sales, at least temporarily. Ridgefield is one of 35 towns that have approved moratoriums, while 15 towns have banned cannabis outright and 12 have approved cannabis zoning. This leaves open the question, is the cannabis culture in Ridgefield's future? How should its leaders decide? Sean Conley, a Ridgefield selectman, put it this way. You could find information on either side. I, I struggled to find anything that was sort of cohesive, yet yeah, there are some benefits, there are some detract. Anything I saw was completely, here's a bunch of evidence why this is the best thing, you've got to do this. I saw a bunch of things that was, you know, health issues, right. accidents, all right. this. Right. And, and so it just be, it's very difficult to trust that when everything is so one-sided, one yeah. right? So, so no matter what your opinion is, and this is maybe why people have such so strong opinions, you can find plenty of articles and data that says, here's, this backs up my position. Yeah. Um, and it just, it, it's hard to tell you know, yeah. if there's bias on that, right? You hit the nail on the head. And First Selectman Rudy Marconi agrees. You know, they are right. There is no single objective and unbiased fact-based source on which one can rely. And even if there was, it would not address the most important question. Is cannabis a suitable business for Ridgefield? The commercial opportunity of cannabis can be blinding. The jobs it promises, the storefront it could occupy, the tourism it could attract, the taxes it could generate. But all that glitters is not gold. And all that promise can quickly evaporate into a distant mirage. The Cannabis Industry Association explains why. In this excerpted video about the prohibitive federal taxation of cannabis businesses and its dire consequences in their own words. You've probably heard about the green rush sweeping the nation. Although the cannabis plant is still federally illegal, in the 29 states plus DC where it is legal for adults or medical use, businesses are now legitimately growing it, selling it, and everything in between. You may think these businesses are swimming in profits, but what you may not know is that they're being taxed at an insanely high rate thanks to a little thing called Section 280E of the IRS tax code, making tax season for a cannabis business owner a real bummer. Imagine paying an effective tax rate 3.5 times higher than the business next door to you because you were forbidden from taking normal business deductions, such as payroll, rent, and other common costs of doing business. Cannabis dispensaries and cultivators are paying an effective tax rate of 70% or higher. By comparison, the corporate tax rate established by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 is 21%. The effect of this is that licensed cannabis businesses cannot invest as much in capital improvements or things like employee raises and benefits, hiring more employees, expanding operations, or giving back to the community. The disadvantages are numerous, from high turnover to higher prices, which drives customers back into the criminal market. And criminals don't file tax returns. Cannabis remains a Schedule I controlled substance according to the federal government, so this penalty applies to licensed cannabis businesses that operate in compliance with state laws and regulations. 
This means real problems for state legal cannabis businesses who are staying compliant while attempting to grow. Meanwhile, it has no effect on illegal operations that don't file tax returns. Well, cannabis businesses can't even deduct many of the costs incurred in staying compliant. To learn more, visit NCIA's website at www.thecannabisindustry.org. Two points merit emphasis. Confiscatory taxes impair cannabis businesses from doing many good things, including giving back to the community. Lawmakers may have been naive if they thought legalizing cannabis would end the illegal marijuana trade, including the scourge of fentanyl. This is no exagger exaggeration. How bad is it? It's so bad that California appropriated $100 million to bail out its legal pot business as it struggles to compete with a thriving illegal market. Yet Connecticut was successfully lobbied by organizations like the Marijuana Policy Project with the irresistible promise of taxes. And not just state and local sales taxes, but also hefty excise taxes, which are the second most regressive taxes paid by Connecticut taxpayers. Not even the Social Equity Council can change that inconvenient fact. By 2028, the MPP projected total taxes of almost $280 million, 66% of which will be in the form of excise taxes, 23% in sales tax. Connecticut Town's 3% tax rate translates into 11 cents on the dollar of total projected cannabis taxes. And based on Ridgefield's local population, our share of the pie is just 1%. And if Richfield can attract cannabis customers from its neighbors, Richfield's share is less than 4%. Taxes from the local market could reach 210000 by 2028. And if optimistically, Richfield dominated the market among neighboring towns, that might, best case, reach over $1 million. Richfield's property tax levy in 2022 is $141 million. With just 2% in compounded annual increases, that will exceed $155 million by 2028. Even a million dollars in revenue is just 0.7% of property taxes, which translates into negligible tax relief for Ridgefield property taxpayers. Projecting a normal tax bill of $10,000 in 2021 with 2% 2 annual increases to 2028 results in a tax bill a little over $11,000 and a cannabis best case sales tax might reduce that bill insignificantly by less than $100 and probably much less. Okay, so maybe taxes aren't the compelling reason for Ridgefield. Meg Sanders of uh, Cana Provisions of Massachusetts, told the ECDC at their public hearing in August of 2021, don't do it for the taxes, do it for the development opportunities. Understanding of this isn't just about taxes, this is about jobs. This is about benefiting your town in a lot of ways. Um, I have 112 employees at, at, at my lead dispensary, 112 in a town of 2,500 people. I'm a significant employer. And that has made a big impact in a, in a town that doesn't have a lot of industry. That impressed Mitch Ancona of Ancona's Wine and Liquors, who shared this reaction with the ECDC at their meeting on September 13th. And I was also amazed on um, the young lady that spoke about her dispensary in Lee, Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's got a freaking hundred and some odd people working for her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that I, can't, I can't get 14 people to work for me. <laughs> like, how do you do that? <laughs> By the end of the meeting, ECDC Commissioner Sean Dowd raised the issue of the tight labor market's impact on restaurants and the need to import labor from neighboring towns. There was a, a, I was a restaurant topic. Um, you know, talking to a couple of different restaurant owners, everybody's struggling with staff, right? So not mm -hmm. a common thing. Um, someone, one of them asked if there was a way to, you know, uh, to transport, right? So like if there was 
kind of, you know, if there's a way to make it more economically feasible to bring in kind of like bus and wait staff from, if they were coming from Norwalk or, mm -hmm. you know, Danbury or something like where the town would kind of promote some type of commute or mm -hmm. kind of bus or transportation or something like that to try to kind of bring staff in uh, like on a, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Has that ever been discussed or? The post-pandemic shortage of labor is part of a local longer-term trend. Between 2005 and 2019, the number of Ridgefield employers has increased almost 18 percent. While the jobs increased 3.9 percent, the labor force lagged, increasing just 3.7 percent. Looking at Greater Ridgefield, including Danbury, Reading, and Wilton, the employer's number increased 15 percent. While the jobs increased 8 percent, the labor force lagged increasing just 7.5%. The demand for labor has outpaced the supply of employees. Ridgefield doesn't need more jobs right now. It needs more employees. But finding employees, even in Ridgefield, may be the least of a cannabis entrepreneur's headaches. Here is Andrew Glassman, chair of Pullman and Comley Attorneys Cannabis Practice, speaking at the Hartford Business Journal's Cannabis Business Seminar in November of 2021. And there are risks associated with any initiation of a business. So you have operational risks, you have management risks, and you have industry risks. So if you take the, all of the basic issues associated with any startup, and then you overlay this particular industry, um, there are additional minefields. And, and I've been listening today all both panels, I was a little surprised at some of the information that I was hearing. Um, and what I mean by that is a lack of specificity in the information that we're hearing, a lack of guidance from the state of Connecticut. And, and I'm not faulting the state of Connecticut, BCP or the SEC. They're learning this process as they go. So as a result, there are no answers to a lot of the questions that people in the audience are asking. And Patrick Johnson spoke as a cannabis business proprietor about the unanticipated pitfalls that can jump out and bite. Uh, what you want to recognize is when you try to find property, right, first of all, you know, you want to make sure you go up to find a town that will allow you to operate in that town that's going to be zoned and so forth. Secondarily, right, you've got to have a landlord that wants to work with a cannabis operator, right? So that probably disqualifies a lot of the properties. <laughs> Thirdly, which we found out the hard way and it's something you want to ask early on is just because the landowner does it, if the, if the landowner doesn't own the building, a lot of times their bank will not let, will not allow him to have you as a or, or, or him or her as as a as a tenant, right? So we thought we had a property. Lo and behold, when we were going to start working on the lease because we only had an LOI, the landowner said, like, you know, my bank's not going to allow us to work together. So on one occasion, we ended up having to buy the building. But in most cases, we couldn't afford doing that. So we, we had to go find a separate, location, a separate location. So very early on, it cost us three months here, four months here. So as you go through this, make sure you've got to check all those, those uh, check out. <coughs> One of the quotes, you know, so, so uh, my, my, my business partner, he's got a saying, you know, and it's true. He, he says, I wake up every morning knowing I'm going to slap them in the face. I don't know by who, and I don't know when, but I know I'm going to slap them in the face. And it's true, like there is, I, I would almost tongue-in-cheek tell you don't get into this business. <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, it worked out, uh, but honestly, there was, there was times where it was just miserable. As painful as those regulations and taxes are for the cannabis business owner, the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse documents that they are an imperative for maximizing tax revenues, illustrating the inherent cannabis business paradox. And even with maximum regulation, the Centennial Institute of the Colorado Christian University has documented that the economic and social costs dwarf tax revenues by a factor of four and a half. But remember this slide. 89 cents of that dollar goes to Hartford. Only 11 cents remains local, while most of the economic and social costs are borne by the community. This may be a net positive for the state, but a major short change for the town. What are our state officials' top priority? 
state tax revenues, or their local communities and constituents' best interest. Fortunately, that is a conflict that doesn't confront Ridgefield's Board of Selectmen, who must make this choice singularly focused on Ridgefield's best interest. There are some folks who will argue that no matter what, marijuana is no worse than alcohol and adults should be free to possess and use it as they wish. This is not the issue facing Ridgefield. That decision has been made for nutmeggers. The question is, will Ridgefield benefit more from being in this business or in deciding Ridgefield is better off with cannabis culture being visible elsewhere? Just because a business is legal doesn't mean every skid row business is compatible with every town, particularly for towns such as Ridgefield. That is family-oriented, academically rigorous in its schools, that is spiritually robust, intellectually curious, culturally dynamic, and where development and conservation and preservation thrive in harmony. So what towns are more suited for the cannabis business? This is another kind of map showing the relative socioeconomic relationship of the 47 towns in Connecticut with a qualifying population of 25,000 or more. Median household incomes range from $36,000 to $206,000 from left to right on the horizontal axis. And the percent of adults with a bachelor's degree or higher range from 16% to 78% from the bottom to top of the vertical axis. These two metrics are highly correlated with a coefficient of 0.9 for the statisticians watching. The eight towns that have approved cannabis zoning cluster in the lower left of less affluent and less educated towns. Nine of these towns, including Ridgefield, have approved moratoriums, spanning the socioeconomic range of towns. The five towns that have chosen to prohibit cannabis are generally more affluent and well-educated. Ridgefield's closest peers, Westport and Greenwich, have said no to cannabis. While there may be no single source to guide Ridgefield leaders and the public in making this decision, there are a few facts worth remembering. Cannabis, while now legal in Connecticut, remains a federally illegal Schedule I controlled substance. As a result, 280E of the Federal Tax Code disallows most business tax deductions, imposing a discriminatory and consequential tax on cannabis businesses that impair their ability to make capital investments, hire and compensate personnel, and give back to the community. Layers of regulation create often surprising and painful regulatory pitfalls. These taxes and regulations apply only to legitimate legal cannabis businesses and put them at a disadvantage to a black market that continues to thrive, threatening the survival of legal cannabis businesses. For Ridgefield, the tax relief cannabis sales taxes promise are negligible. The jobs it might create would only add pressure to an already tight local labor market. And the economic and social costs dwarf any tax revenues, most of which go to the state, while the economic and social costs fall disproportionately to the community, which may be why more affluent and better educated communities have said no to the cannabis business. So here is a final and critical thought. While charming and beguiling, the cannabis genie may look benign and harmless enough now. But like so many tempters, once it is released, it can't be put back in its bottle. Once legal, zoned, and permitted, there is no turning back ever. There is no Back to the Future episode that can repair this irreversible mistake once it is made. This video, written, narrated, and produced by yours truly, Kirk Carr. Thank you for watching.